Hi everyone. So we're up to uh, study nine, which is chapter eleven and twelve of Romans. I pray as we get underway. Yeah. All right. Lord and Father, thank you that we have got to this uh, amazing passage in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 11, um, and help us, and, ch and chapter 12, uh, and help us to uh, uh, to learn something of what we uh, gain from your word here today. And we pray that you would help, we pray that you would help Steve as he guides us through this discussion. Amen. Uh, well, I sort of started off by saying that chapter 10 sort of ended on a pessimistic note, but the more I read back over it, the less I was convinced that, I, that, that it is a <laughs> pessimistic. Um, so it certainly, it ends, you know, the last verse of Romans 10. Um, you know, all day long I've held up my hands to a disobedient, obstinate people. Um, sort of has a, a sort of uh, pessimistic view of Israel. Um, but Chapter 11, Paul asked them, you know, start off with asking that question, did God reject um, Israel? Um, has he rejected his people? And it's obviously asked in a way which you meant to say, no, can't possibly reject his people. Um, but the question does raise the, it raises the question that in a church that is increasingly even then, increasingly Gentile, um, what relevance did the Jews have? Um, you know, are they now just a footnote of history? Um, and what was the ball talking? And he went to yeah, he, he made to himself to uh, actually preach the Gentiles because yes. of his rejection by the Jews. And, yes, and, and well, Paul Paul says, you know, he, he begins by saying, "Well, obviously he's not finished with the Jews because I'm a Jew." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so he um, he brings up this faith idea of the faithful remnant. Uh, that even though the majority of those who are Jews by birth um, reject the gospel, um, there remains a faithful ref remnant. Um, and he's already he's already mentioned that idea back in back in chapter nine. Not all everyone who is of physical descent from Abraham uh, is a child of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So that you know Israel is. Um, in that line of promise, and bits are sort of getting so yeah the um, Jacob Esau thing and um, Isaac um, Ishmael sort of split, but it's um, and he now brings that up again um, with um, this reference to the. the the time um, of Elijah, where um, it obviously seemed very, um, things seemed pretty grim, and the majority of Israel were apostate, but God had kept a remnant of faithful people uh, all through that. Um, Are you referring to chapter 11, verses 1 to 10? Yeah, yes. So, Would it be helpful for me to read that? Yep. And then, in fact, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. Uh, am I, an, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? 
uh, how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. And I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If for grace, uh, would, uh, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly they did not obtain, the elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Uh, uh, yep. <laughs> Wasn't told how many are in that remnant. Huh? That would be a very uh, <laughs> piece of information. Good <laughs> answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It would have been significant time of Elijah. That would um, have been a fairly sizable number of the portion of the population. They were never a huge nation. Um, so it was certainly a lot more than what Elijah thought there were. So it may not be a true significant number. No, it may not be. Yes, but it was certainly a significant number. Um, it was not just Elijah and a couple of mates. Yeah. Um, um, I think verse 6 is interesting that the, that. Salvation is by grace, then you would expect that this is what would, would be. Um that there would be this um faithful remnant rather than everyone who be who was physically descended from Abraham being of the true Israel, uh, because that would sort of contradict the whole idea of God saving people. Of election and grace. Is there a predestination? Was that a that? Yeah, I think I think so. That yeah, um, you would, um, the idea that that um, there is this election and and people chosen by grace for grace, um, that there would be this. It couldn't be then be tied just to descent. Um, And then it has this bit that, um, that the others were hardened. I think that's um, quite similar to what Paul said back in Romans chapter 1, how people really um, chose not to um, follow what was obvious about God uh, you know, from the created order they they rejected the knowledge of God, and then God gives them over um, to their unbelief and sin. So what happened first? They reject God, and then God took them? Yes. It, chapter one. God yeah. gave them spirit stupor eyes that could not see and hear that could not hear. Does that mean that, you know, he's already, uh, well, I should say that it's determined who's actually going to act that way or be that way? That's one of the hard parts that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's not important for us to know. I think the thing is that um, what God does confirms what people are, right? Um, yeah, in the beginning of Romans 1, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God that gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts, the sexual impurity, so on. So I think it's, it's the same sort of thing is happening with the Jews. They, um, they, they choose to reject the gospel and therefore God gives them over to that. 
um, um, he in return sort of sort of further hardens them and um, makes the gospel sort of a stumbling block to them. So, so they're sort of wrapped in this unbelief. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think it, I think I think it's, it's it's Israel is no different to the rest of mankind. They reject God, and then God gives them over to that rejection to suffer the consequences of that. Yes, they've known God in uh, you know they have more they have more revelation of God than human, mankind in general had, and they've still chosen to reject the gospel. Um, yeah, in different ways. Yes, there were so. Um, but then, um, then Paul again sort of asked another rhetorical question. Did they stumble so as to be poor beyond recovery? And he says, not at all. Um, can we read that section? Yeah, we can read that section, yeah. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel eminent. But if their transgression transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater the victims will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and say something. For if their rejection brought reconciliation with the world, what will their acceptance be like from the dead? Part of the dough offered as those fruits is holy. Then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Yeah. So the... Um... So Paul sees that the the, um, the Jews rejecting God has led to the Gentile mission, um, and that seems to be the way Paul operates in every city he visits as well. He goes first to the synagogue, preaches to the Jews. When they reject him in that city, he then preaches to the Gentiles. Um, so it's a re sort of repeated pattern. Um, and it's there's and if you look at the same repeated pattern, there's always some Jews who are converted in each of the cities that mm -hmm. Paul visits. Um, yeah, so the faithful remnant. Um, um, so uh, their rejection has led to the um, the mission to the Gentiles, but it's not. Um, it's saying there's a sort of um, if 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 them rejecting brought this, what will happen when they finally are converted? Um, that there will be this sort of um, this thing of a sort of feedback loop. Um, that as as the Gentile church grows, um, so will the Jews see what they've missed out on, um, and. Um, and that if they then mm. come in, there's this cycle of ever greater blessing um, as the gospel spreads. Um, it reads a lot like the, you know, we've got kids that are, you know, that want the same toy. Mm. One doesn't want to play with the toy at all, so the other one, the younger one starts playing with it. And then all of a sudden, the older one wants it as well because the younger one's got it. And it's totally unfair that they've got it, and this is my toy. And the, 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 sort of, you've got a childishness to it, yeah. isn't it? 
Uh, and yet instead of saying, well, if somehow it's going to raise their envy and, and that means that they're going to be saved, then, oh, well, that's... Mm. Um, yeah. To rock, rock custodians of the history mm. and having them in the early church would have been helpful. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I wonder what the Gentiles must have thought every time they, you know, Paul quotes to them, like Elijah in this first passage here, in the first part of chapter 11, you know, don't you know what the scripture says in the passage, the general's going, no. <laughs> what is it? Really? Oh, wow. That's amazing. And then the Israelites going, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've forgotten that. Yes. <laughs> well, so I think that the, the people who know the scriptures are the, like, the people higher up in the hierarchy and the their Jewish church, I suppose, that they would know that every the common layman like this is being familiar with scriptures. What do you reckon? Yeah, in general, Jews were, well, they were well-educated people. Um, they were more literate than most people in the ancient world. Boys, yes. Um, yes, they did know, the, you know, the ordinary people did know the scriptures. Um, and there were probably a surprising number of Gentiles who did as well because yeah. a lot of the Christian converts... Uh, the early Gentile converts came from these people who were interested in Judaism um, because, you know, there were a lot of people to whom the, the monotheism and the um, the sort of strong ethical component appeal. Yeah, so I think Paul is talking about there is these passages. Yeah. And people are reading what they actually read or what they know about it. Yeah, and... And the church would have been studying the Old Testament from the beginning. Yeah, that was the scriptures. Um, so they've been encouraged to do that ever since they've been converted. So some of them probably knew, some of them probably, oh, I didn't know that bit, but yeah. And they've known some of the names, like the name, yeah. the name Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's probably the same thing with the Jews. A lot of them probably think, oh, yeah, I remember that, but. It's not had any significance for them. Yeah, yeah. Almost like an occupation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, they. Um, he doesn't have any problem with quoting scripture to the people he's writing to. He sort of expects them to accept its authority and to be familiar with it. Um, and then. Um, yeah, so he's expecting that there's this positive feedback of blessing and mission between Jews and Gentiles. That uh, yeah, um, Jewish rejection leads to Gentile mission, then Jewish envy of Gentile blessing will bring the Jews back to look again, and yeah, it would sort of cycle. Um, and then he has his. Um, um, his olive tree analogy. If someone would like to read a bit from 17 down to 24. Yep. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the other and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either, either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild in nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? You go further, Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, So the, this analogy of the olive tree is sort of saying that it isn't necessarily final. Um, that the um, 
that the Jews are lost. They can be grafted back into the olive tree if they come to faith. Um, but that the the olive tree has this root uh, in the God's covenant. Um, so there's uh, there's no place for arrogance on either side of Jews or Gentiles. Um, by grace, for all of them. yeah, it's by grace for all of them. So Gentiles shouldn't boast because they're grafted into a tree whose roots are in God's covenant with Israel, and they shouldn't boast over the branches that were pruned off, because exactly the same could happen to them if they fall into unbelief. They can be pruned and replaced with other branches. And God is able to graft back the pruned branches. Um, so no one can boast about their position since all the branches are in the tree because of God's kindness, not the inherent worth of the branches. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they came from a wild olive tree or the cultivated olive tree of Israel. They've been grafted in because God chose to, in his kindness to graft them in. Um, and we're putting them out of them Yeah. Um, the real movement in um in these sort of chapters uh, you know, from nine, ten, and eleven, given that they sort of stand alone, but at the part of that integrated argument. Um, I was just uh, as you were talking and you're saying, you know. Who are we referring to here? You talk to the Gentiles, that the Gentiles don't overstep the mark in here. I look back and I realize, well, chapter 10, you know, it's looking like chapter 10 is likely to the Gentiles as well. Brother and sister, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. So sort of, you don't sort of say that to the Israelites, you say that to somebody else mm. about the Israelites. So it's chapter 10. And 11 seem like you've got the same audience in mind, that Gentile audience. But if you go back to chapter 9, um, uh, at the beginning of that one, it's uh, verse 6, it's not as though God's word has failed for not all who are descendants for Israel are Israel. Are we talking about Jews? Are we talking about Gentiles? Um, that's 19. One of you will say, then why does God still blame us? Um, is that the Jews or is that the Gentiles that are part of this? It sounds to me more like it's 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 either the it's, it's both. Um, but at points he's saying uh, you need to speak particularly to what the Jews might hear, um, particularly since when you look at verses twenty five, you've got the Gentile address. It seems like you know. I will call my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved ones who are not my loved ones. And in every place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there will be called children of the living God. It looks like that's the Gentiles. And then Isaiah cr uh, cries out concerning Israel, though the number of Israelites be like the sands on the sea. It's almost like he's addressing the Israelites. Then in, in verse 13, what shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, that's, again, it's almost like it's the he, he's moving between audience to audience. Mm. Um, you know, Israelites, you sit on the right, right hand side, Gentiles, you sit on the left. Let me let, let's have this discussion and see what that looks like. And it brings us constantly back to the one point we are all in the same room together because of what, because of what Jesus has done for us, um, uh, which helps us understand the argument as you get to the end of chapter 11. Yeah, so he's arguing that neither, neither party has any grounds to um, think themselves more highly than the other. Because they are all saved by God's grace. Um, so he goes on to talk um, about God's providence. Mm. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God 
have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy, a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have his mercy on them all. Um, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's talking to everybody at that point. Um, but I think he, he's saying that God's plans for Israel are not over. Um, he hasn't, they're not a sort of footnote of history and the future of the church is entirely Gentile. Um, and he's saying God's plans for Israel are not over until his plans for everything are over. Um, I kind of wonder to an unique way for Israel to go to the old Israel or the new Israel, which includes Gentiles. Yeah, this is it's um, give her the full number of Gentiles has come in. It, that has to be the new Israel, doesn't it? Mm. Like all new Israel, although that's not translated there, but all Israel, and so all of those who are actually the chosen people of God, Jew or Gentile, they are all in. in the, all the truth. Yeah. I think that's all new Israel. Yeah. Um, but some people interpret it as being the old Israel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's, I was, um, let's say there's, um, which is which is funny because if that's the case, then. To, to accept that that is all, all all Israel, then you are conceding that you are dependent on the Gentiles to have all come in before you are uh, able to come in because of the logic of that argument. They've experienced a hard part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And all the hard part of Israel are redeemed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but either way, you're still dependent on the Gentiles um, so, so much for being that superior nation that gets to call all the shots. It's the Gentiles we're now waiting on. It's the Gentiles that we are dependent upon. Um, and so that doesn't remove some of that holistic. Mm. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, there's a um, quite a danger in connecting God's plans for his faithful remnant, you know, the true, his true people, with... Um, with the fate of national Israel. Um, and there's um, there's a danger of thinking about God having two separate peoples. And that's something that's actually out there. Um, the, um, there's an idea called dispensationalism, uh, which... Um, um, it's um, it's an idea, like there's lots of different variations of it, but it's an idea that God has two separate peoples, uh, that the Jews and the Gentiles are separate peoples with separate separate paths of salvation, um, and it's um, it's actually an idea that's fairly widespread um, and influences a lot of. Um, a lot of American-based denominations. You'll find it in some churches here. So, um, like, you know, the Gospel Chapel people on, on Berea Street, um, they're rather influenced by dispensationalist ideas. Um, some Baptists in the Church of... My mother came from Church of Christ. They, they're rather influenced by these ideas. They... They said, even if they don't actually believe all the core of dispensationalism, they use the sort of language. They talk about multiple dispensations. Um, and it's actually, so, you know, <laughs> they need to go and read Romans 11 um, because God has one people. There, one, there is one olive tree uh, to which both Jews and Gentiles have been grafted in. There isn't this idea that the there are two paths and the, um, the Jews can be saved by anything other than faith in Jesus. Um, but that it's, a, it's an idea that's out there and it's actually quite a dangerous idea because it's, 
it's influencing American foreign policy. Um, um, uh, and it, um, read you a little bit from this, it says, dispensationalism has had bad consequences for Jewish evangelism and for Palestinian Christians. Some extreme dispensationalist groups believe that the Jews will be saved during a period of apocalyptic tribulation. Therefore, we should not preach the gospel to the Jewish people, only help them to return to, their, to the land of Israel and to drive out the Palestinians, as this will hasten the second coming. Yet this means conveniently explaining away passages that promote evangelism towards the Jewish people. Uh, a bit more, yeah. What is more, Palestinian Christians in the Holy Land are sometimes regarded as obstacles to the second coming. Some American dispensational churches have even written letters to these Palestinian Christians urging them to leave Israel because they are preventing the second coming, despite the fact that they and their ancestors have been in the land for nearly 2,000 years. So um, misunderstanding this relationship between Jews and Gentiles and how God has this single people it has real consequences. Um, and what is the idea that we can delay the second coming? Yeah, well, this thing, people who are into dispensationalism are also into wacky ideas about the second coming. Uh, well, you can remember this is recorded, everyone. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, you can see the reason why that would come out of verses like 20, 25 here. Um, that if you are waiting on the Gentiles to to um, either come in or get out, um, then uh, it will allow that second coming where, you know, real Israel then gets saved. Um, but you can imagine, like the way that Michael Bird talks about that in there, you can imagine saying to someone, look, I'm really, really concerned about evangelism. It would be very helpful if you could step out because once you're out of the picture, then I know that I'm saved. But that's effectively the implication of that. I'm Jew. I, I, I'm Jewish, so that I've got I, I've got this promise. I will be saved. But really, what I'm waiting for is either you get your act together and you become a Christian, or you be, you become Jewish actually, or if you could step out, that will mean that that you are no longer the obstacle to that second coming to allow me to enjoy all of the things that, that I have. That, that's, that's the implication. You need the fullness of Gentiles, so... Yep. For a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you actually want them all to become Christian? Well, not unless it's the full number of chosen Gentiles. So if you're not going to accept it, you're clearly not chosen. Step out so that you stop getting in the way. Um, now, you could also see that in church context as well. Um, you know, uh, we believe we are saved, we've got the gospel, we've got this, and there are all of those pagans out there that don't. So, um, you know, we can either go out and find them, or if that's not the case, then let them go wherever so we can get on with the job of, of you know, hearing the gospel. Um, that's a little bit once removed, but that's the implication. You know, we've got something that they don't. If they don't want it, then really to hell with them. Let's let's hold on to what we've got and make sure that we protect that at all at all means. It can be, but that's the reason for Michael Bird's argument that it affects our evangelism. Um, because we take the high road position. It's, you know, I've got the view. I can see what that's, that's there. Don't get in the way of the view because... You know, I don't want to lose something that I've already got. Usually, what's stopping you is that you're meant to be dealing with. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Which is somewhat the argument of what this is trying to say. It's Paul saying, look, I'm waiting, waiting so that I'm doing the ministry that I'm supposed to be doing. Whether that is to do a Gentile, I'm doing the gospel proclamation so that all people will be saved. First the Jew, then the Gentile, and if it's because 
the Jews have heard in their hearts, the Gentiles have heard about it. Isn't that fantastic? And as Steve has said, um, and if that then means the Jews go, well, hold on a moment, they can't have something that I don't have. So that they then all of a sudden take it more seriously. Praise God, you've got both the Gentile and the Jew. And either way, the result is more people are saved. Most people come here. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. The um, I think Paul's next bit is um in the the doxology it sort of takes up a bit of this um that there's a bit of a mystery in what is going on here because he says, "Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom of knowledge of God! How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, as or who has been His counselor?" Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? From him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So he's saying that there, um, the plans of God are much deeper than what we can understand. Um, so, in some ways? yes, it is. Bits, bits of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, yeah. It's as I'm Job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um. So yes, there's God has plans in the future. Um, but we shouldn't be presumptuous. We should just acknowledge that God is what God is doing is greater. And what we can fully can't comprehend. Um, so our our response should be worship, um, not trying to plot it all out. Um, And uh, so it's it's using that um, that whether that doxology is referring to just what he's just been talking about um, about whether it's the his plans for Jews and Gentiles in into the future or whether it's really referring back to the whole of what Paul has been talking about up to this point as he's ex as he's been explaining the sort of more and more details of the gospel message. Um, and its implications for things, um, that the right response, um, the right response to knowledge of God is adoration and worship. Um, that it's, that, that it, um, it's not purely a, an exercise of intellectual curiosity, um, so that we might know how deep God is and, and so that we might be driven to worship him. There are books written by people who for curiosity's sake look into the gospel and they've always ended up with them being converted. Hmm. Once they realise the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Morris and Him of the Stone is famous for that one. Lee hmm. Trouble. Faith of Christ. Yeah. So what's his name, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Philip Yancey. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Right, right. He was he he used to go to disprove the gospel. Not my story, but Pius. I set out to prove the resurrection was wrong. Sorry. That's a bit of a silly move to do. Yeah, so uh, at the in chapter twelve, we get this quite a pain. Um, so he up till now he's sort of been um he's been talking about all these sort of doctrinal issues. Now he's sort of come well in light of all of that, therefore, 
this is how you should live. And that sort of follows on a bit from the doxology of um, encouraging worship. He then goes on to sort of expand what adoration for God and worship actually is. So if someone want to pick up reading, um, let's go from down to... Down to, to just the first couple of verses. Yeah. Oh, urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your body a living sacrifice, holy and full of God. This is the true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God really is, his good, pleasing, so he's um he's saying how we live could be informed by God's mercy. So he's talking about gospel informed living. Um which sort of harkens back to that verse, the righteous will live by faith, he quoted right at the beginning of the book. Um, he, um, so he's um, using verse um, um. Excuse me, I'm just looking at this is not the version I read when I prepared. Um, it looks like this version has taken what was the footnote. Um, yes, yes, the previous version of NIV said spiritual worship. And this version has taken what is the footnote in the previous edition and said this is your true and proper worship. Uh, whereas uh, the Previous version of NIV had um, um, spiritual with a footnote saying reasonable. Um, so I think the um, I think it suggests that the the uh, that a life lived in this way is the only option to respond to the gospel. So you can't respond to God's mercy other than by living it out. Um, so our response to what God has done for us can't be inward-looking or mystical. It has to express itself um, in living in the world in a holy way and being in, being in service to others. Um, Let me ask you, when people in churches, even like this one, Talk about, you know, this is your, if you were to say to somebody, what is your true and proper worship? What do you think they would say? Well, like, what do they think worship is? Like, uh, yeah, it would depend where, where you asked. Yeah. As there were, there were, um, in, there are churches where it's all, it's all singing type stuff, the, the, the sort of charismatic churches. And there are other churches who would see the Lord's Supper as their primary act of worship. Um, uh, but I think, you know, what Paul's saying here and what we tend to want to teach is that worship is living rightly in the world, um, responding to God's mercy by living properly in the world, caring for others, spreading the gospel. It's in practical service. It's in practical service, so yeah. That's a good work to events, but they're the result of the... Yeah. I mean, that really does change a way that we use language a bit. Mm. You know, when you think about worship, we are often thinking about the adoration that we give, and that may still be true, but the way that we think of that adoration is, is usually things like singing or praising God. Mm. Yet here it's saying, in view of what God's mercy is, 
after your body's living sacrifice, the tautology, the, the um, oxymoron of that expression is a funny one. I think, mm. you know, as a sacrifice doesn't sound very living, but this is often itself as a living sacrifice. So th there's a there's a cost that comes here. Yeah, the giving of yourself to the service mm. of others. Yeah, yeah, that's mm. right. That in a way that's holy and pleasing to God. That is your true and your proper um, worship. How do you do that when you are? You know, hands raised and singing in church, that's a good thing to do, but that's not particular worship that's being referred to here. It seems more like spiritual worship. Uh, which is the mm. reason for yeah. that. Yeah. 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 But it's an aspect of worship. Mm. I mean, it's, it's still worship mm. something you should do. Yeah. So that's right. So, you know, you go to other places in the Bible, I think, to make that, you know, um, sing a new song, uh, and sing a glorious song. So you've mm. got all of the Psalms to be able to pick up on that one. You've got Colossians that talks about the way that we sing praises to God, um, sing praises, hymns, and spiritual songs uh, in uh, to one another and to God. And so there are other places you could go. I'm not sure that you, you want to say that worship is not singing or whichever, but that's right. But what this is clearly saying is not that's not the type of worship that's in mind here. This is uh this is about the way you use your bodies, um, the way that you serve it, and, and the way that you do that in a way that actually can um in view of what you receive from God means that you prefer uh, the rest of the time you love your church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, well, yeah, like you know, didn't know what you do in church. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because that's what you do in church too. Yeah. Um, um, but if it's only in church, then we've got yeah. a very limited understanding. Yeah. Like you probably have that. That's the wrong application. So yeah, yeah. Um. So he talks about um. Do not conform to this pattern of the world, but be transformed which is an idea he's talked about earlier, back in Romans 8. Um, about not um, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on the flesh, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. So he's... He's coming back to an idea he's already raised about being transformed by the Holy Spirit um, and renewing your minds. Um, and he said then that then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So what do we think? God's will refers to here. Well, is that the same thing we've talked about? Not serve it to others? Does it mm. to worship? I think so, because often people um, people want to think about God's will in terms of their personal decision making. Uh, knowing, people talk about knowing God's will as knowing which job I should take, which person I should marry. So that sort of question. Um, but I think that's sort of not what's in mind here. What Paul's talking about God's God's will is that you live like this. And he goes on to fill that out um, about using gifts, about loving others. Um, now it's all full of um, doing things for other people. Um, I think you know, God's that um, th there's a common view that has a rather narrow focus on what God's will is and tends to confuse it with personal decision making. Um, I can understand that because we're told so often that God has a plan for our lives. Mm. So we just need to keep checking in what He wants us to be doing. In this plan, with this plan for our lives, because we don't know it all at once. So, yeah, I can, I can see. Or you only allowed us to know what we need to know at the moment. Yeah, yeah so rather than we should know that time to live a righteous life. Yes, I think that this, 
yeah, this is this is how you should live. Get on with it. Uh, yeah. Um, Got the marks for true Christian to come down further. Mm. So, will we read the next bit? Yeah, we'll read the next bit. You can see me here. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Right after that. Okay. For by the grace given to you, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So it's quite a familiar list of things, isn't it? We've seen these um, lists, lists of gifts in other letters. Um, I guess it doesn't end one any better than the other. Sorry. No, no. Um, you can do my bit. Do your bit. If you adjust that little toe in the body, you still got a function. Yeah. I like that those three you've got in accord with the faith God has distributed each of you. And so, you know, we often focus on some of the gifts given, the grace gifts that are given. The way we understand that is according to the faith that God has distributed. So that's, you know, gives you the motivation behind how you do what uh, you do, which he then goes on to explain. So when you are in Christ, um, you are one body, each member belonging to all the others. Um, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a freaky sort of idea to think that you know my body is not my own; it is actually belonging to all of the others that are make up that that one body in Christ. Um, in which case, then use the part of the body that you uh, or the parts of the body so that it's beneficial. Yeah, there's another one. This uh, where the um, this newest NIV has very is different from the previous edition. Um, because the previous edition has in accordance with the measure of faith. Yeah, right. Um, so which is why I raised the question, does it imply um I don't think verse three is implying that faith is a quantifiable thing. Um uh the emphasis there when it sort of talks, you know, it says with accordance to the measure you've been given, as it says in the previous NIV, is not that it's that some have more than others, but that it is a gift. Um, and so you should think of yourself as sober judgment because what you have, you have been given. Yeah, you shouldn't think of yourself as better or worse than others because what you have has been given to you by God. Uh, it's not that you have more of it than someone else. Um, and he goes on by basically listing gifts and saying if you've got the gifts, use them properly. Um, it's it's not about your status. Um, it's about what God has given to the to the church. And I think in the same context, it's up to the church to allow people to use the gifts they've been given, and not and not stop them because they're not part of the illegal thing. Those gifts are going to be something that is beneficial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I give bagpipes doesn't seem to ever be a doctor. I really I do not understand why that is the case. Of course. Okay. <laughs> yes. Years ago, the, when the busking first became really popular, sort of after it stopped being illegal. Um, there were lots of buskers all around Sydney. Yeah. And then the council decided that they would allocate spot 
mm. so that there weren't too many buskers in one place or the other. And they gave a fellow who played the bagpipes the Devonshire Street Tunnel. <laughs> Glorious, glorious, glorious things. Never seen what's wrong with that place. Never seen a lovely sound. Yes. Well, you can hear that. Yeah, good point. That may be. Have you ever heard the trumpet play badly? You probably have. Um. I hope that that gives a really interesting because I think we've got a tendency to forget sometimes if we have are so given to us by God. Yeah. All the benefit of the church. Oh, not mm. the, yeah. So not mm. Benefit of us rather than benefit of the church. Mm. 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 Yes, people people talk about them all the time, but don't don't seem to emphasize the fact that they are gifts. Yeah, it, it seems to be a status yeah. thing rather than. It's got to be tough. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think the, I think the schools do this. They talk about gifted and talented mm. without really distinguishing between gifts and talents, as if they're one and the same. Yeah, yeah. that's not the social. Schools don't have to do that because it's a latest to Well, mm. yes. Yeah. Uh, what's also interesting is the motivation of the manner in which those gifts are then exercised. So you could be, you could have the right motivation and you could be exercising the gift according to the, you know, the, 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 the measure. Yeah, that's right. But the manner in which you do it could be completely inappropriate, which still, which makes it wrong. Uh, and so a number of times I've had conversations with someone who said, but it's the right thing to do, or I, I never did anything wrong. Mm. By the letter of the law, you haven't broken a rule. You are motivated by the right things. Mm. But the manner in which you have chosen to exercise that gift is actually the, the error in, in all of this because it hasn't been beneficial or hasn't been helpful to people. And so... It helps us understand what that love looks like, you know, in, uh, in action. Um, uh, and often when I hear criticism or I hear strong feedback, I, uh, you know, listen to it well because there is usually something in there that's helpful and true, perhaps. But if the manner in which it's being delivered is unhelpful, it's very hard to hear that truth. Mm -hmm. And so you have to listen even harder to try and work out what in that, if you take the personality out of it, you take the hurt out of it, you take the approach out of it, is there anything in there that we can take, pay attention to that we should be paying attention to? Um, it is a hard thing, hard thing to do. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I think it's interesting too that because we have these, we have multiple of these lists of gifts and how they're exercised, and they're not all the same. Which suggests that there isn't really a, def there is no definitive list of gifts. Well, I don't know if yeah, yeah. But if you put them all together, can you have your definitive list then? Well, I suspect not, because why then would you include some and not all? Why would, if there was a, a definitive list of all the gifts, yeah. why would you not use it every time you mentioned them? Or at least, yeah. Um, was it too many to count? Yeah, there are too many to count. I think that's. Well, I think a lot of the description of the gift came out. I read it in the notes. Later, with the emphasis in the Pentecostal with the yeah. two gifts only, they get to think more about that for more discerning people mm. about what the gifts were. And, you know, you know, so I think one of the greatest gifts in the church, and I've seen people in our church have got the gifts of gifts of encouragement. Mm. Mm. I think it's really difficult. I think it's really hard to give. I also think that people get it wrong. Uh, mm. Hospitalities and things like that. Mm. They're very shaded, they're big, they're very shaded. They went, they, they became this, the whole thing became the two hard drives. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we tend to reject the whole concept of gifts because 
been abused in churches and and people only talk about the spectacular ones that are yeah, showy. I have seen that. Yeah. In church. Hmm. Okay. I think that came up quite a bit as we're going through the One Corinthians series, hmm. the last part of One Corinthians twelve. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Thirteen and fourteen, mm -hmm. a number of conversations that we had um, coming through about how do you use or exercise those spiritual matters that you might have and when you do it and why you do it. In there it's quite clear it is for the building up and then you think whatever it is you're doing is that building up um what are you tearing it down um but uh it's it's the right question to ask you probably should be asking and it was quite interesting how as we went through that the number of times i heard stories from both within our church in the past or from other denominations in the past where people had been hurt so badly by this framework that had been put over the top of the gifts in which to determine what the gifts were before you're allowed mm. to use them or not allowed to use them. Mm. Um, and you can see the hurt that that, that, that sort of existed with. Uh, yeah. absolutely. Uh, um, you can hardly sort of adjudicate on because you don't actually know the context of what that was. If, if um, I won't say it because of the recording, but if there was somebody else who usually is in this room, um, you know, I, I know that they've got some history with another denomination where um, created all sorts of significant issues, faith issues for them as they were being told you must show your faith in this particular way. I tend to think I have a gift of <laughs> the, the gift of someone's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but that's how most things that I've ended up doing in the church has been because no one else wanted to do it. Praise God. Praise I'm, God. Um, I'm so thankful. Yeah. I think that's well, probably true for most people. I used to be able to do whatever that thing is. They also served in the family way. Yes. It's always someone to find gifts to be able to do that job. So, yeah. I think yeah. I do think, though, there's a time, it, it's helpful for us as a church. Now we're talking a little bit more. Um, sorry, I'm hijacking a bit, but um, there is an element where we as a church need to recognize that just because people exercise their gifts in particular repeated ways doesn't mean that we're off the hook. We need to keep serving and working out ways uh, to do that. And so I think of, of people, particularly at uh, you know, in one of our gatherings that every week does a particular job that is really, really important that a lot of people don't want, want to do. Um, and uh, I still look at that and think, well, actually, I think it'd probably be helpful if other people worked out that they could exercise that gift and actually it'd probably be good for them to exercise as much as it for the people who, who always do it. I had a conversation with somebody who was doing the same thing over and over and over again. I could see it was wearing them out. And, um, and I'm saying, um, and they said, even if, I, if I'm not on to doing it, I get called into it because people need to ask more, more about it. And I'd say, well, why don't you stand on the other side of the building, the very far point, and do something else, some exercise a different type of gift, um, and see how it goes. And they did that one. And sure enough, other people stepped up and did the role. Um, and I thought, well, maybe that's a helpful thing to remember. We each have a role. We've got to do that. But I can understand the burnout, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, so we want to read the next bit. Um, Which one are we on? Nine down. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Love must be sincere. Okay, what is evil? Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, ancient in affliction. Faithful and proper. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not pay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, said the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, that's the book. That's the book. Uh, keeping keep burning coals on his head? That's the book. That's the book. Right, yeah, yes. yeah that, that's an interesting bit. Well, am I fine? This is your head. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you look at... If you look at the commentaries on that verse from Proverbs, Proverbs um, they, it doesn't necessarily mean what we think, what the obvious meaning is. Um, um, uh, the, the commentaries talk about it in terms of some ancient ritual, um, that it's, it's talking about driving people to repentance. Um, Saying sorry because you know you got the whole whole mm -hmm. thing caught on you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um. What I noted there, in verse thirteen, it's there with the Lord's people who are in need. But in verse twenty, you you do it to your enemies. Mm. So it's it's not. I mean. Are you saying that a lot of people can also be your enemies? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying it's a contract. Yeah. Yep. Um, that 13, if you just look at that verse, hang the care would only be serving the churches. In the churches that were finished, dealing with the community. Yes, but he's. this is just following on for, from a section where he's been talking about gifts that are specifically sort of Church oriented. Mm. So it's possible he's at this point, he's still thinking in terms of how you behave in church. He's following on from the gifts. And there's a little bit of that in the um, in the way he's used, he's talking about each gift. He says how you should do it. Mm. And then he's talking about, then he says love must be severe, sincere, and on another, never be lacking in zeal. So he's talking to some extent still about. How you operate in that context, and then he's expanding out. Yeah. Um, this eleven is pretty tough. Though. Never be lacking in zeal. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yes, there's, there does seem to be a sort of a bit of a divide between 13 and 14, isn't there? Is it, the 9 to 4, 13 seems to be more concerned with what came before, and 14 seems to be more concerned with the world, yeah. Well, yeah that's good observation. Well, section breaks in the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah, the section break. Well, it should have been maybe there. And the, the 9 to 13 is part of the discussion of gifts. But some of the, some of what's down there is is like that as well, though. But, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. That could be either outsiders or the election. Yeah. Hmm. So yes, it all spills oh. over. It spills over into how you live in the world, as well as how you live in the church. Mm. So when you keep burning coals on a tent, then you just sort of uh, uh, showing, you know, what the grace of God and your actions. You know? No, I think it's more you make them feel guilty. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Please. <laughs> so, in such good lives among the pagans, like the one Peter I did, they will see your good deeds. Yes. What happened? Oh. Yeah, they're sitting here, yeah. Sam. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So impressive with uh, caring for the sick, Christians and yeah. non-Christians, yeah. it really influenced Roman policy. 
Yeah, you know, we we've got you know we've got to compete with this. Isn't it? But even beyond that, you know, you stand before Jesus, and um, uh, it's easy to point the finger in, in every different direction. But when Jesus points the finger in you and says so, so when you see this given to you, when you see this done then how is it possible that your reaction to that was to do this? You know, uh, here is the, in that sense, what you've done is you've poured you know, burning coals on your head because you, you, you're you pulling judgment on the uh, If you've rejected that, really, you are living the consequence of that is. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that picks up that Romans 1. He gave them over. Um, and so the judgment they experienced was actually the consequence of the sin that they embraced. Uh, and that's well before Jesus returns again to, to judge them. It's it's the sin that they were indulging in was the very thing that was the consequence in this time and place. I wonder whether that's what mm -hmm. that's helping us recognize. Mm -hmm. I have a commentary here within that verse 20 that says, when you're treated wrongly, you don't have to avenge yourself or become angry. You can leave the wrath to God and it's not going to get treated with God. Mm -hmm. It's, it's you know, do the right thing. Yeah. Christian thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good to yeah. remember too that when you're pointing the finger at someone, you've got finger, more fingers That's pointing right. back at you. Mm. It's a better hammer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. Um, uh, yep, I got it. Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, verse 21 do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Is that looking back at some of the things he's already said about uh, not living according to the sinful nature, but being transformed? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it might refer directly back to the few verses in front of it. So your enemy, hmm. you don't let him overcome you. You don't let the evil you can overcome you. You will repay him with good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you won't let times. that evil watch you, you do the right thing, you do the Christian thing, you feed him, you give him drinks. That's why we make sure everyone has a drink. I love, I love the um, practice hospital. How is there? One of the things that my, one of the many things my wife has taught me. Um, because we do a lot of hospitality. It says, you know, the Bible tells us to practice hospitality. It doesn't tell us to practice entertaining. Um, and, um, you know, the number of times I've heard our conversations with people about what it means to be hospitable, it's not about putting on a show. It's not about making sure everything is perfect. It is about being hospitable um, and inviting people in, looking, caring for people in there. It gives me a little bit of heart every time, you know, you come in and we haven't had a chance to clean up the whatever room it is or to leave whatever it is, you know immaculate because life just sort of happens I think well the imperative is to be hospitable it's not to be entertaining that's not, so much of what we do is about making sure we put on the best face no I'm not sure that's always the right thing to do it's, it's right. I'm sure under a lot more stress than you yeah. it's yeah mm. yeah yeah it's um yeah Having said that, there are times when people come over and I think they might think that we've been wrong. Um, <laughs> at least in that room. <laughs> Their house was broken into. And the police came and commented, what a mess they had. <laughs> Nothing but this is what it's not. <laughs> yeah. We had a break in at school. Oh. I guess I do. But then they take taken from right to your desk and I've said oh, anybody got else they want to raise? Because we're we getting towards the end of our time. So we're only I'm looking at the uh, studies and are we only going from chapter let's start the last one. Was that thirteen to It does. It covers thirteen through to the middle of chapter sixteen. Remembering that in chapter in the very first unit we did the end of the the end of the uh, Romans. So we will end up covering all of the bits um, that are in there.
Um, Sorry, I just that just reminded me. Next week we're having um, Russell's dedication. Maybe more than two. Um, Is that here? Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> It'll be fantastic. I'll be able to hear all sorts of things about Romans. That'll be great. Do you know if the morning tea is going to be in there or is it going to be in here? Will it go on past one o'clock? Yeah, well, that's what I'm not sure. It's only going to be in morning tea, as far as I know. Would it be Would it be shrewd and helpful for everyone if we were to do 1.30 next week instead of one o'clock? Would it be possible for everyone? Yeah, do I think it may can you? Yeah, okay, Mrs. Brown. Um, well, for you. Yeah. Well, why don't we do that and that one rebuild us a little bit like to get people to build and stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that would be. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think she's been too many from what she told me. Can I make a comment structurally about this? If I happen to be sitting an optional exam on Romans, um, that may be helpful to look at. Um, when you when you look at um, the section that we've just moved into the end, but chapter 12, verse 1, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, what the therefore, therefore, it's in, it's it's probable that that therefore is one of those significant therefores in the structure of the letter, which moves you from the theology of the section before into the practice of what follows, because chapters 12, 13, 14, 15 are very practical in nature. And so when you look at the structure of Romans, that's actually quite helpful. And often examiners will try and work out the argument of a letter by looking at those structural markers. So that's worth paying attention to. There's a little bit of argument that that therefore is actually the response to chapter nine to 11. So therefore, if that's what it is to be one together in Christ, Jew or Gentile, then live your life this way. But it's possible that that could also be not just that statement, but we're actually summing up the whole first 11 chapters of Romans. So that makes it a significant therefore. Um, one of the things you should have noticed as we've gone through Romans is that there is a long integrated argument that keeps coming to it, but what if, but what if, or what about, or what about along the way? One of the ways to work that is not just the question, because if you go through your, your text, if you go, if you print out Romans, you go through text, you can write question, um, a question mark against each of those statements. So you will see, you know, he'll, 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 you know, what then shall we say? Shall we go on? And here's the question statement, and his answer is by no means. Then you'll have the next one. What then? Shall we sin because we're under the law, but under grace? By no means. So the question is a structural marker. So is the therefore. So go back to the beginning of the, the beginning of Romans. So again, I'm trying to give you a give you a structure of what, what you've got there. Romans is introduced by telling us what the gospel is and how um, how we live by that gospel. Um, that gospel is something that is not only God's grace, but it actually also shows us God's wrath. So look at the beginning of chapter 2. You, therefore, have no excuse. So the implication of that truth in chapter 1 comes in the therefore of what follows in chapter 2 which then leads into an argument that sort of flows in a little bit to understand what it means for God to be faithful to us, even though we have been unfaithful to him. That leads us to that wonderful section on the righteousness of God being revealed in Christ. And then an example of that in, in Abraham in chapter four, um, in uh, where they do. So you then get to the beginning of chapter five. Therefore, Therefore, since we have been justified, and so it's a, it becomes that structural mark, okay, there's the end of that particular argument. Now let's move into the next part. And so chapter five, you then, uh, from chapter five, you then have that, that clear sort of therefore, which, which is, is repeated, and that section flows through to the end of chapter eight, the end of chapter seven. Then you go at the beginning of chapter seven, therefore, there is no condemnation. And so five to seven, you see that argument about how are we made righteous when the law still exists? Where are we in relation to the law? 
And so chapter 8 starts with, well, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that argument of what follows through from there um, into what we've just actually had in um, 9 to 11 gets to the beginning of chapter 12. And it says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So let me see how that marker is actually helpful for holding the argument of the letter to, together. And so if you were sitting an optional exam, it's helpful to see that movement because it helps you order, order in your mind the argument of the letter. And to get the exam is actually helpful for helping us understand Romans in the way that it flows in the way we move. So I don't know. I'll come over the top of the idea of what you said. That may be a helpful way just to sort of see uh, full right. And therefore, it's a very important. Make sense? It's the last therefore. It's the last therefore. It's the last significant therefore. I'm not sure if there is an, um, there, there are other ones, you know, chapter 14, there's 13, there's a therefore. So, but, but the, the, the right question, because just because the therefore is there doesn't mean it's a major change. I think the beginning of chapter five, beginning of chapter eight, beginning of chapter 12 are significant changes in the argument. Whereas if you look at, for example, the therefore in chapter 13 of chapter 14, uh, verse 13 of 14, I think that's that's the implication of that immediate argument. So I don't think it's a structural argument change, but it's helpful to recognise as you work your way through. Mm. Which is maybe help um, in where you go. Every time you see that, it's worth thinking, what is this? talking just about the section that's come before and now the implication, or is it actually a whole argument? Thing? How about I pray and we'll go. Thank you for leading it, brother. Lord and Father, thank you so much that we can come to this wonderful, wonderful letter. And as we've now looked over the last couple of weeks at this glorious section in 9 to 11, which helps us see how we are united in Christ as one people, despite our nationalistic differences, or maybe even our spiritual giftedness uh, and the differences that roll with that. And we can import a whole bunch of other things in there. Um, we pray that you, you would help us to take the challenge of the beginning of chapter 12 really, um, uh, you know, really to heart as we think about what it means for us to um, live in the, in, the, uh, in the light of your mercy and to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in obedience to your will um, and help us to, to, to recognize the importance of, of that obedience in the way that we carry out our worship of you, um, both on our own um, and uh, collectively um, as we meet. Um, and so, Father, we pray that you would take us and use us and all of those who are doing this at a latter time. Um, we pray that you would help us to work out how to serve you well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.